Welcome. This is Gary Salton, Chief of R&D and Creator of IOP Technology. This video tests the reliability of IOP behavioral patterns. So, what is a pattern? Patterns are sequences of typical behaviors. These behaviors are often referred to as styles. We all command a variety of them. Sometimes we are dominant, other times compliant. Sometimes restrained, other times spontaneous. IOP strategic patterns explain and predict the sequences of these different behaviors. Traditional tools recognize that style shifts occur. They talk about it, but they furnish no numbers to act as points of comparison. They can't. This is because they use rank order measurement. The Homeland Security Scale is a good example of this kind of measure. All you can say is that a severe threat is greater than a high one. How much greater? No one knows. This is the measurement level of the traditional tools of organizational development. Now some of them try to get around this by assigning numerals to the various levels. However, it does not matter if you name a high level 4 and a severe level 5. You are still trying to divide categories rather than numbers. The result is nonsense. Without real numbers, you cannot make probabilistic projections. That means you cannot predict behavioral sequences with any measurable accuracy. IOPT is unique in that it measures things on a ratio scale. You know, like a ruler. A ratio scale allows IOPT to use arithmetic. And that means you can do things like add, subtract, multiply, and divide. If you can do that, you can calculate behavioral probabilities. However, you need something more to get a meaningful result. You need a theory. There must be some kind of relationship between things for arithmetic to make sense. Without this, you can have no confidence in any predictions. For example, I might count the number of ducks in my backyard in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I might then correlate the number of ducks with the size of the next Russian grain harvest. Say I came up with a high correlation. Would you run out and dump a lot of money into Russian grain futures? Not likely. There is no causal thread between my ducks and the Russian grain harvest. No reason why my ducks and Russian grain should co-vary. That thread is what theory provides. A theory defines what causes what and why. Well, IOP theory provides that kind of causal thread. And here's how it works. Every IOP style is just a name given to a specific combination of input and output preferences. These lines show that every style shares an input or output component with its neighbor. These relationships are what tie the styles together into a predictive unit. They all involve information processing. Information is always relevant to what will be done next. And what is to be done next is central to behavioral sequences, in IOP terms, strategic patterns. So, we've got measurement and a theory. What else do we need? Well, we need some kind of standard. Some basis of judgment. You know, a point of comparison for determining good or bad, or high and low. The performance of similar tools is a usual standard. However, in the case of strategic patterns, there are no similar products. Without exact measurement, traditional tools can offer no quantitative touchstone. And that puts IOPT in a class by itself. So, we'll have to rely on the absolute measure being high enough to satisfy the scholars and professionals in the field. But it should be kept in mind that this is a stress test. Measurements are going to be made under the worst possible reliability conditions. The results you get in actual practice are likely to be much better than those reported here. If you want detail on the design of the stress test experiment, you can go to the style stress test video on IOP.com. This is its icon. Or you can read about it in even greater detail on our research blog at this internet address. Both the style and pattern stress tests use the same data source. So, what did this data tell us? The basic structure of the experiment was the classic test and retest format. An initial test is compared to a retest using the same instrument. 
This is the result at a profile level. All of the IOP patterns are shown as quadrants in the graphic. IOP's exact measurement can calculate the degree to which the test and retest profiles are the same, their degree of overlap. In this case, the overlap is over 92%. Repeated tests give the same result. That is the measure of reliability. And 92% meets anyone's reliability standard. And remember, this is a stress test. People are actually trying to change their results. 92% reliability gives assurance that large-scale interventions, you know, cultural interventions, multi-department groups and the like, are grounded on a firm foundation. Some individual test and retest surveys did change, but those changes tended to cancel each other out. And we will find out later that this was no accident. The net result is a stable profile. However, for the professional working with individuals or with smaller groups, it is the individual level that really matters. And the part that matters most is the dominant pattern. This is the combination of styles that produces the largest quadrant. Remember, this is not just an illustration. It is an exact measurement. The reason that a dominant pattern is important is that it comes to characterize a person. It is what the professional is going to hear about in a debriefing. So, what did we learn when we looked at the test and retest results for dominant patterns? Well, two-thirds of the individual retest had exactly the same pattern as the original test. And this was under stress. This is the worst that would be expected. Let me give you an idea of what was involved in the stress test. This graphic shows the test and retest profiles of one person. The original test in red, the retest in yellow. The time between test and retest was 2.3 hours and the results of the first test were known before retesting. To get this kind of result, you have to change your judgment on many survey responses. This kind of total reevaluation does not happen in two hours. This is clearly conscious manipulation. The database has other similar examples, some of which occurred in less than five minutes. Now remember, a dominant pattern is just the one with the highest rank order. How much higher does not matter. Here is an example where a change in just one response caused a change in dominant pattern. Clearly, this type of change has no practical consequence. So, what if we pull the obviously manipulative and inconsequential changes from the data? Well, here are the results. The dominant pattern reliability rate jumps from 66% to 76% and there is still stress. All we took out was the most egregious examples. Why don't we take a deeper look at just who was changing and where they were changing to? This table shows that people using the conservator strategy were twice as likely to change their pattern on retest, 40% versus about 20% for everyone else. The structure of the experiment did not allow for interviews, so we don't know why more conservators tried to change their results but we know that they certainly tried harder to change. This suggests that it is reasonable to assume that most retesters did not want a conservator outcome. However, the bottom row shows that the conservator pattern did not lose on retest. The conservator strategy shows no avoidance. In fact, it shows a little strengthening. Okay, so what did this little analysis tell us? Well, it tells us that the IOP survey has integrity. It cannot be manipulated to produce a particular result. This should be of comfort to scholars and professionals whose recommendations can ride on the accuracy of the survey outcome. By the way, remember we found that the overall IOP profile was highly stable on retest? This is why. The people who were changing patterns had no particular direction to their change. The survey gave them no clue as to what their changed responses were doing. The individual changes just washed out. So, what else can we find out from the individual responses? Well, we know that simply changing responses from the initial test will generate a pattern change. An unpredictable change, but a change nonetheless. 
We also know that memory dims with time. So, if people were really trying to change their pattern, we should find their success rate differed by the time taken between test and retest. People who took the retest sooner should better remember their initial response and be able to choose another. We can measure that change by looking at the shift in the overall profile. This graphic is an example of that kind of shift. It captures all of the changes, regardless of the area in which they occurred. And here is the result. The people who changed within hours had a 49% overlap. The people who waited days had a 60% overlap with their previous result, a much higher level. In other words, people who retested sooner had more of a change, and a statistically significant one to boot. So, what happened? Well, both groups were probably trying to change their profiles. The short cycle group probably remembered their initial responses, taken only minutes before. They merely had to change the response to get a different diagnosis. The dimming memory of the long cycle group made them less likely to remember their days ago responses. Answering arbitrarily would have made the survey retake a useless exercise. The only option left was to follow some semblance of their true judgment. The net result was that their retest profile tended to more strongly resemble their original diagnosis. This finding confirms that the stress of the stress test is real. It's a gold standard. People were trying to change their results. If they weren't, we would expect that the average test-retest overlap to be the same for both the long and short cycle groups. They're not. Secondly, the retest timing study confirms the structural integrity of the IOP survey. In the absence of being able to remember prior responses, people revert to giving something closer to an honest evaluation. This honest evaluation parallels their initial response. Confidence that the initial IOP response is an accurate one is enhanced by these findings. So, let's summarize what we have found out. First, the reliability of the IOPT overall profile at 92% under stress probably exceeds anybody's standard of acceptability. IOPT can clearly be trusted for large-scale work. The IOPT dominant pattern reliability of 66% raw and 76% refined has no comparable reference from other tools. On this dimension, IOPT is in a class by itself. However, Comparing it to the style reliabilities of the traditional tools might be useful. This table shows that IOP pattern reliability exceeds the style standards of traditional tools. This is in spite of the fact that patterns were assessed under stress and that pattern reliability is a more demanding test than is its style counterpart. It is reasonable to maintain that IOP patterns far exceed any reasonable reliability standard. The study also demonstrates that there is no discernible design within the IOPS survey responses. Scholars and professionals can trust that the results will not be contaminated by conscious manipulation. Next, test-retest timing showed that the stress in the stress test is real. People were consciously trying to change their original diagnosis. This is not typical in real-world settings. IOP performance is likely to be much better in normal conditions than even the high levels reported here. Finally, test-retest timing confirms the accuracy of the original test. The dimming of memory and the absence of discernible response design meant people had to rely on their true evaluations as a guide. These true evaluations caused the retest profile to increasingly resemble their original test results. This strongly suggests that the original test results were indeed accurate. In summary, IOP pattern reliability has set a new standard. Scholars can trust IOP as a foundation for their studies, and professionals can rely on it as a firm foundation for their initiatives and recommendations. Thank you for viewing this video. If you want more information on IOP, you can go to our websites at IOP.com or OEInstitute.org. Thank you again for your interest in IOP technology.